Hi again, this is Andy, KE4GKP, and welcome back to the Ham Whisper and Lesson 12 in the General Class Operator Element 3 exam. In this lesson, we're going to go over the G3A questions, which cover sunspots and the ionosphere. Specifically, the G3A questions go over sunspots and solar radiation, ionospheric disturbances, and propagation forecasting and indices. All right, the first question. What can be done at an amateur station to continue communications during a sudden ionospheric disturbance? Well, what you can do is you can try a higher frequency. And as you start to get more and more involved in, in HF, the ionosphere starts to play a big role in propagation. And the general rule is the lower the frequency, the more signal is impacted by ionospheric disturbance. So by that rule, 80 meters is much more effective than, say, like 20 meters. I'm not saying that you have to make that big of a shift. Sometimes you just need to move a little bit higher in frequency within the band. But if you're having trouble communicating because of sudden ionospheric disturbance, try moving up in frequency. What effect does sudden ionospheric disturbance have on the daytime ionospheric propagation of HF radio waves? Well, it disrupts signals on lower frequencies more than it does on higher frequencies. And it's the same theme as the last question. So if you're having trouble in lower frequencies, move to higher frequencies. How long does it take the increased ultraviolet and X-ray radiation from solar flares to affect radio wave propagation on the Earth? Well, it takes approximately eight minutes. And this just so happens to be about the same amount of time it takes light to get from the sun to the Earth. So the ultraviolet and X-ray radiation is traveling about the speed of light. So if, if you know that you, nothing can go faster than the speed of light, the correct answer by coincidence is also the fastest of the possible answers on the exam. So if you think speed of light and really fast, that's how long it takes X-ray and ultraviolet radiation to reach here. What is measured by the solar flux index? Well, the solar flux index measures the radio energy emitted by the sun, and I'll go more into that in the next slide. What is the solar flux index? And I kind of wish this question preceded the last one. The solar flux index is a measure of solar activity at 10.7 centimeters, which is a wavelength. So being able to determine the density of the ionosphere is critical to knowing how effective propagation is going to be. And that's especially true when dealing with the long distance propagation with the F layer, which you remember from the technician class course, is the layer of the ionosphere which is most responsible for long distance, low frequency propagation. So the solar flux index measures the intensity of radio noise at 10.7 centimeters. And the solar flux is measured on a scale somewhere between 60 and 300 usually. The higher the activity, the better the propagation. What is a geomagnetic disturbance? Well, a geomagnetic disturbance is a significant change in the Earth's magnetic field over a short period of time. And geomagnetic, geomagnetic storms are a big type of geomagnetic disturbance, and they're usually caused by a significant increase in the speed of the solar winds and charged particles associated with that. And these are usually associated with propagation disturbances, which are bad. So, a geomagnetic disturbance is a significant change in the Earth's magnetic field over a short period of time. Which latitudes have propagation paths that are more sensitive to geomagnetic disturbances? Well, those greater than 45 degrees north or south latitude, so essentially the areas surrounding the poles. So, if, if you can see the northern or southern lights, or you're in an area of the world that can see the northern or southern lights usually, that area is more sensitive to geomagnetic disturbances, and thus it's going to affect your signal propagation a little bit more. What can be an effect of a geomagnetic storm on radio wave propagation? Well, the effect is degraded high latitude HF propagation, which is basically the same thing as the last question. During a geomagnetic storm, the closer you are to the poles, the worse your propagation you're going to have. What is the effect on radio communications when sunspot numbers are high? Well, long distance communication in the upper HF and lower VHF range is enhanced. So, for the most part, sunspots are good. And if sunspot numbers are high, propagation for 10 and 6 meters is, is really good. So 10 meters is in the upper HF and 6 meters is in the lower VHF. So that's kind of what you want to kind of remember when you're thinking about this question. Sunspots are good, especially for the 10 meter and 6 meter bands. What is the sunspot number? Well, it's a measure of solar activity based on counting sunspots and sunspot groups. So sunspots are cool areas on the sun that are associated with higher than normal magnetic activity. So the sunspot number is basically a count of sunspots and groups of them. There is a direct relation between the sunspot, no sunspot number and the solar flux index we talked about earlier. So the higher the hot sunspot number, the higher the solar flux index. 
how long is the typical sunspot cycle? Well, it's approximately 11 years. And sunspots come and go in cycles, and that cycle is about 11 years. And this is one of the ones you're just going to have to memorize. So 11 years is the typical sunspot cycle. What is the K index? Well, the K index is a measure of the short-term stability of the Earth's magnetic field. And it, it's a short-term measure of the geomagnetic field and uses a scale from 1 to 9. The closer to 9, the stronger the activity. For reference sake, 4 and higher is considered a geomagnetic storm, which is, like we said earlier, bad. And it, the K index is measured roughly every 3 hours, so it's something that you want to look at for short-term stability of the Earth's magnetic field. What is the A index? Well, the A index is an indicator of the long-term stability of the Earth's geomagnetic field. And the A index is basically made up of the averages of the K index. So what you need to take away from this is that the K index is short-term, the A index is long-term. How are radio communications usually affected by the charged particles that reach the Earth from solar coronal holes? Well, HF communications are disturbed. Now, coronal holes are areas of the sun's outer atmosphere which eject charged particles into the solar winds. And one of the effects that it has is that the solar winds speed up. And they do so considerably, and that results in a geomagnetic, geomagnetic storm when it hits the Earth. So, like we said earlier, geomagnetic storms are bad for HF communications. How long does it take charged particles from coronal mass ejections to affect radio wave propagation on the Earth? Well, it takes about 20 to 40 hours. So, like coronal holes, coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, eject charged particles into solar winds. Now, normally the solar winds travel about 400 kilometers per second. Now, coronal mass ejections and coronal holes can increase the speed of the solar winds to up to 2,000 kilometers per second. And the solar winds will take about 20 to 40 hours, 40 hours to get here from the sun. So, that's how long it takes par charged particles from coronal mass ejections to affect radio wave propagation on the Earth. What is a possible benefit to radio communications resulting from periods of high geomagnetic activity? Well, the answer is aurora that can reflect VHF signals. So, like we're saying that HF signals are hurt by high levels of geomagnetic activity, VHF signals, you can bounce off of the northern lights. So, that's one of the benefits of high geomagnetic activity for radio waves. At what point in the solar cycle does the 20 meter band usually support worldwide propagation during daylight hours? Well, 20 meters will support worldwide propagation at any point in the solar cycle. So 20 meters is a good solid band regardless of where the sun is as far as the solar cycle goes. And for the average amateur, it's pretty much the go-to band for DX. So 20 meters will support worldwide propagation at any point in the solar cycle. If the HF radio wave propagation or skip is generally good on the 24 megahertz and 28 megahertz bands for several days, when might you expect a similar condition to occur? Well, you'd expect a similar condition to occur 28 days later, and this has to do with the rotation of the sun, which is roughly a 27-day rotation. Now, the other thing you got to read in this question is that that 24 megahertz and 28 megahertz skip is usually really prevalent during high levels of sunspot activity. So if the sunspots are good in one area of the sun, you might have to wait until the sun does a complete rotation to get that same spot again. So you might have to wait 28 days. Which frequencies are least reliable for long distance communications during periods of low solar activity? Well, the answer is frequencies above 20 megahertz. And what you need to take away from this question is the general theme with sunspots. And that is that, you, that they come in very handy for long distance communication with frequencies above 20 megahertz, such as the 10 meter band. So, frequencies above 20 megahertz are the least reliable for long distance communications during periods of low solar activity. And that is the end of the G3A review and part 1 of the lesson 12. If you have trouble finding part 2, go to hamwhisperer.com and look under the ham courses page. You can find it there. Otherwise, take a break and I will see you in part 2.